don't have to put us online yet, Marvin, but you can if you want. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for this Sunday that we can come together. And I, and I pray as we go through this uh, message today that you would really give comfort, um, give uh, some insight into the things that you would have from your scriptures today, the, the very core of what we believe. Father, we thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Testimony time. Does anybody have a testimony? Has God done something that only God can do in your life? You've got to share it. Incredible. He does it every day you woke up. I want to say the not so great thing is my razor almost cut all my whiskers today, John. What is with that? They, get, they show you on TV how these razors cut right to the quick. Triple heads. Does it all. Yeah. I'm just happy to be here. Um, I think the Lord has been with us and we don't even know it and we need to give him the glory because even the small thing, well here he is, Mr. Reader. We were waiting for you. Oh, I thought you were going to do a song. Uh, no, yeah, you got here, you're good. Everybody just voted that you were going to sing the next song. Happy birthday song. That's the only one I know. Oh. Anyway, Adam, what we're going to talk about today is, is why. Right now we're asking for testimonies. Has God done anything in your life? Yeah, all the time. That you'd like to share? No. <laughs> Let's keep our lights under the bushel. No. I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. No. Nope. Well, you know two songs. <laughs> How many of you know that song? Yeah, I'm not going to lead it, so that's too bad. <laughs> Sing it in your mind while we're preaching then. I just wanted, again, thank everyone for Vacation Bible School. Mandy got most of the decorations down yesterday. Uh, what a great time we had. Um, and you know what? I know there's two railroad VBSs out there. Someday we'll be able to ride on the train, kids. Someday we'll be able to go to the museum, kids. Um, and when we get chances to do that, we will. Um, yes. Maybe, <laughs> Jacob will, yes. Maybe next year we'll be on space travel and we'll go on Elon Musk. Uh, maybe. Not a $200,000 a ticket. <laughs> we might have, you have to raise funds for that, I'm thinking. But anyway, we want to thank uh, everybody for participation in that. Um, our Bible study people cracking the word out. I just, Kathy and I go home every day, John and go, man, I remember we had to do the music. You had to do the music. I had to do the Bible story. We had to both do crafts together. It's just it's so neat to have a family like this that the crafts get done, the music get done, and, and we never, never have failed to have enough treats, even for me to have some. And, uh, and, and, and we really stumbled on uh, Summer's artistic ability on this one. I was impressed with that. That would, that would tickle me. Uh, but anyway, it was a great time, and I just think that's how God does things. He brings people together at the right time with the right need to do the right thing to move his hand. And that's a great thing. Anybody else want to share anything in the late great... God touched you, rise up and walk. Well, then open your Bibles. Matthew 27. Y'all got y'all have this like we're fogged in with smoke attitude today. Everybody's a little bit on that. We have to do some things. Uh, Adam, would you read this backwards to them? So they get their heads going or something? Or remember we have um, we're baptism. Yeah, anybody else that needs to be baptized, we've got a list to add to. We've got at least five now um, for baptism. Matthew 27, and uh, this, I want to tell you, this is, uh, huh? Are we dismissing the kids? I don't know. Are we? Well, we were, but you have Well, nod your head. We haven't dismissed this yet. Kids, get out of here. Y'all, get, get. I want to talk to you like my little white birth control pill that we have at home. He, he got in the habit years ago of jumping at my sprinklers. I have the tripod sprinklers. 
And then him and the big dog started knocking them over. So I, this week I lowered the standard. I retracted all the legs to make them be a little tall, like this. Yeah, so what? I came out this morning and it was knocked over again. So I thought, well, I'll make it not so tired because the dog will jump all day at the sprinkler. Billy, the dog will jump this high all day long and try to grab the water coming out of the nozzle. Until he can't jump anymore and then he breaks the sprinkler. And then, and then his tongue's hanging out like this and he's still trying to jump. So then he kind of jumps and puts a paw on the sprinkler and tries to get him up to there. At the end of the day, he's laying there shivering when it's cold and, and just, I, I don't understand why I feel so bad. Well, I know why you feel so bad because you're not supposed to do that. But anyway, so I lowered it this small. It's this tall now. He still knocked it over. It's like at the end of the day. It's be Willie, right? It is Willie. Willie loves that water. We call him our white birth control pill because when the Airedales are supposed to make babies, he bites them in the bottom. He runs around and snaps at them and keeps breaks the romantic dinner apart. <laughs> and so he's like perfect birth control for the Airedales. It's like, I'm not doing this with that guy. Anyway, it's pretty, pretty amazing. I, I'm going to tell you this sermon came out of, I was angry, and then I just thought, no, not if God uses it to give us more insight. We were at work, sitting there minding our own business, trying to get through the permits and the billings and the estimates and things, and somebody who will go nameless walks in behind us with another person and goes, Hey, you guys are in the same club. And I thought, we're in the same club. Yeah, you both have sons who died. Well, that's really what Kathy and I wanted to start thinking about at 9 o'clock in the morning as we start to tear up while we're going over the wax and the billing things. And I turned around and I, I knew the man he was talking, brought in with him was... Uh, had lost his boy when he was 14, and it had been several years. And I'll tell you, he was as wounded that day as we were. It hadn't left him at all. And I thought, how inconsiderate to bring that up like that, because it's not the kind of club that you want to share. We don't have letterman's jackets. So I stewed about it, and I got angry about it, and I thought, you know what? What can I do? And I prayed, and I prayed, and I thought, Really, God can use this to his glory. And uh, I, I, folks, when someone loses someone they love, I think it's important that you bring it up. But I don't think you bring it up as a contest or as a, you know what I'm saying? I'm thinking, never forget your loved ones that go away. I don't say that. But uh, you can't compare each other's grief because you're all wounded mortally. You're all wounded and uh, so I went into this message, and I haven't shared this passage of Scripture for seven or eight years with us, and I thought, you know what, God can speak through it to strengthen us, and uh, it will help us to come to a reason. And, and, I, and I know it's the truth because I didn't go through Moses, I didn't go through Isaiah, I didn't go through Paul, oh, I didn't go through Peter. This is Jesus' account of the whys that we don't have answers to in the world today. And hopefully we can get some comfort and strength from this passage again. And I've asked Adam to read it for me. And you'll recognize the uh, setting on it. It's in Matthew 27, and it's right at the death of Jesus. Why don't we stand while we read this? From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, Yama Sakbathani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of these standing there heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar and put it on a stick and offered it for Jesus to drink. The rest said, Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. 
And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs, and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurions and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. And then in the 53 to 55th twos, as many women there were watching from a distance, and they followed Jesus from Galilee to uh, care for his needs. And I wanted you to remember that. That was the picture I want you to have in your mind of this passage. Um, I remember the one where they brought the hyssop branch up, and he didn't drink from the painkiller that he was offered. And um, it doesn't say in this one, but you remember the second thing he, he cried out on the cross? It's finished. He gave his spirit up. And I pray that that passage will constantly be a motion picture in your mind that you can be lost in and remember him in. And you can frame that as a portion of the scriptures in your heart and life. You may be seated. Um, thank you, Adam, for reading that. I want to leave this with you with that picture running in your mind when someone brings you to this passage of scripture um, you, you really won't be able to uh, understand everybody says his words differently but always remember um, that he said this my God, my God and the reason they had trouble understanding him at the time was Elijah and and the Christ, what is the word, other word for God, he, he, his language was enough muffled that they didn't really know for sure if he really didn't call Elijah. So they were th And because the disciples would think, well, remember when they went to the transfiguration, they came back to him. Maybe they thought that was happening also. But it's not material to what's going on here. The question that I want to bring out for us today is, is why? Why do things happen and if you've never asked those questions, then you're not living. You're not living. I remember the night we got the call um, that Joshua passed. I argued with JB on the phone. It's pretty stupid. He says, but I'm standing right here looking at him, Don, because I know. And, and so the, you begin, after you get past the anger, you're, why, why does this happen? And I know from you and the congregation, you, you really, it, it's, all this is going to take on a different meaning. I know it does to me because um, I always thought when I was serving the Lord with all my heart, people would say, well, you'll never know Jesus until you're crushed. Well, I knew him pretty well. And I think that's not a wholly true statement because you can know Jesus before you're crushed, but you're going to know him in a whole new measure after you're crushed. You know, God doesn't crush us just to get us to know Him. God gets us to know Him so when we are crushed, we glean so much more from Him and He speaks to us so much clearly because our minds are not contaminated by this world. We are focused on Him. So I don't think it's necessary for you to be crushed to know Jesus, but I don't think it hurts you to be crushed to know him more. Does that make sense? Because really, if he just wanted to step on your head to get you to believe, he could do that. That's not the goal. We're a relationship. We're in a family. We're in a marriage together. And so we have those questions. Why uh, Why is that little baby? Did you catch that? Did you? I didn't look for it and I found it anyway. The little baby being lifted over the, bar the wall at the at the airport, the barbed wire, and here's a mom who gave her baby to some stranger to hand over the wall to one of our GIs. And he took that baby and that mom never even knows if she'll see the baby again. And our soldiers took him to herself. Um, a question for all pacifists, I'd like to be that guy that helped that lady out. And that's why I was there. Why does the kid step on the landmine and another one? Why does the drunk driver... I always had that, 
a kid in our a year behind us, he was the janitor. And every time I drove my car to school, because we had hot rods, and I didn't park exactly in the lines, he would tell on me and make me go move my car. So senior day, we parked this way in the parking lot instead of this way just to be kids. But he left the tavern one night with him and his wife down there by the river. And he was, as he left, he... I guess I have to tell you the whole story. He liked Fords. Can you believe it? And we were Mopars and Chevrolets. Anyway, so he, he always wanted to be the hottest kid in school, but he was a janitor. He had kids that were already coming into the school. And he fired his Ford up and had side pipes on it, and he screamed down Keys Road. And he went off the road and rolled over, and he would have been into a plowed field and came out on top, and everybody's okay. But in this one place on that whole road, there was an off-ramp coming, and when that car rolled, the hood, the top, landed upside down right on that off-ramp and killed them both that fast. So here was a kid a couple years behind us that, uh, oh, he got a lot of life insurance money, but he had no mom and no dad because he had to put his foot down and drive fast and drink. And you wonder, how come he couldn't roll off 10 feet that way or 20 feet that way and miss this ramp exactly the wrong time in the wrong place. But we have times in our lives like that and we go, why? How, how can that be? The odd thing, I've seen some pictures, well maybe one of those ones is, i seen the guardrail come right up between a husband and wife in a motorhome and go right into the back when they hit the guardrail, John, and didn't touch either of them. You've got a guardrail for an armrest in your motorhome and why is a hard question? How is a hard question? But today we're only going to deal with why. Now Jesus is hanging on the cross and he goes, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And you want to know that why has a whole different meaning to it. You see, from the beginning of time, Jesus knew what, what it was like to be rejected. So the why wasn't there to show Jesus why he was rejected. He knew why he was rejected. Um, think about it. All along he lived with the stigma of the community knowing that his mom and dad weren't married before he was born. Oh. He knew that he was a carpenter in the village. Because, you know, the plumbers are always higher rated than the carpenters. Electricians are always higher. The carpenters are like the first guys that lay the foundation. And they can't go anywhere until the electrician puts the wires in and we can't do anything until the plumbers put the plumbing in. But he was a carpenter. He worked with his hands. And honestly, I always said, there are waitresses that should get gold medals. I do not understand why. A carpenter that can build a square building, they're a rare commodity. Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever noticed that, Randy? A guy that, you can't, it's not just cutting boards and nailing them together. I found that out. I, that's, Mincy, that's why I do, I'm a, a welder. That's why I'm certified as a welder, because if you have two pieces of metal that don't quite line up, by the time I run a bead across them, you can't tell that I missed. If there's a hole, a gap in the middle, I'll run two beads down it, and they'll look really nice, and you won't even know I didn't have enough metal to make it, because I didn't measure exactly right. You, you're supposed to know geometry to be a carpenter. Yeah? You're supposed to know how to figure angles. and So anyway, you can see that Jesus knew early on, and, and then he went to the temple, and can you imagine him knowing all the answers to all the questions, and they still despised him. Get this kid out of here. Can you imagine saying, ooh, ooh, I got the answer, and he always has the right answer, and he befuddled them, let alone he could read them to them and make sense. And then you understood that um, he went to Jezreel. And at times Jesus knew, Father, what is your will? Let me do your will. And he knew he was in God's will, and here he is on the cross. You don't think, why don't figure out? God, I'm doing everything right in my life. As far as I can tell, I'm going exactly where you want me to go. Then why is this happening to me? 
God under Jesus understood God's plan and he knew it would be painful, but I'm sure in the bottom of his heart, being all of humanity, would say, I don't get it. God, I don't, why? Why? In that point in Jesus' life, he'd been totally dependent upon the Father's direction and leadership, and the hardest question of all came to him on the cross. Why? And at the moment when he says why, I want you to have that movie reel go to the fact that your relationship with God is an ongoing work to pray constantly, to let Him talk to your heart, and now there's a lid, a cap, put on top. <laughs> I didn't know this would mean separation from you, Father. Ah, hell is going to be that place where you cannot communicate with the desire of your heart which is God. Hell is going to be that place of separation. It's not a place we're going to go and have a barbecue with your buddies, you know, and, and, and roast the fatted calf. But at this point, he was totally dependent upon him, and he calls out to God. And I think that's important for you to know, because in your time of doubt, in your time of need, in your darkest valley, if Jesus could say, help me for my unbelief, I don't know how this could be happening to me. I don't know why it's happening to me, but I sure don't know how. And so it's true, sometimes we can't do enough for our kids, and I can imagine you, you're seeing full God and full man, and I don't even know if I can explain it right, but as a parent, you know that you want to do all you can do for your kids without hurting them. And can you imagine the Father in heaven having to turn away from his only begotten Son? And can you imagine the only begotten Son saying, well, where did you go? You like kicked me out of the nest. Well, because sometimes you know what we need? We need heavenly intervention. And that's really what took place here. Heavenly intervention. And we always need to know at this point in this message is that God always knows why. And I, and I want to jump ahead, and I hate to do it because I might ruin the end of my message, but you want to know what? Why will be a word that becomes obsolete when we get to heaven. Think about it. You won't have a why when you get to heaven. So how do we know that Jesus asked it? Think about what he's doing here. He's educating his disciples. We know that Jesus asked why on the, what is it, on the, they do it several times on the Pirates of the Caribbean. Well, if everybody was lost at sea, then who told this tale? <laughs> well, they told the tale because Jesus told them the tale. Jesus gave him the words that we follow after this. John had already been taken Mary as his mother, so and led her away. So Mary, mother of Jesus, was already with, with John, taken away. The disciples were already hiding. It's dark, there's an earthquake. The disciples were already hiding. The guards didn't even understand what was going on, and they thought maybe Elijah, there's going to be a big show here, a really big show. And so Jesus asked, why? How did this account get here for us today? How did, how did we get to know what happened at the cross? Because on those 40 days after the resurrection, Jesus walked and taught and told his people. Remember when, even before the ascension, when he walked with the disciples and they said, didn't our hearts burn within when he told us the things? And he told them the things they already knew. But Jesus came and told his church, told his disciples what had happened. He shared his pain, he shared his doubts, he shared his victory. And if you go to the point of mind that they had, is they thought that it was all for loss. They thought Christianity in its earliest terms, with no name even, the way was ended. And when Jesus came back from the dead, he said, no, but this is what you were going through. This is the pain you had. This is the doubts you had. These are the, the, the victory that we have now. Because we've overcome death. We've overcome that. Why in this world today? Here's, I've got several whys that, that hit us all the time. 
Why is the world such an awful place? And it's because of sin. And the thing about sin that I learn more and more as I see it progress, sin always reaches further than, they, than you think. It always affects more people than you can imagine. Sin is not just a white lie, because there is no such thing. A lie is a lie. And it goes on and on and, wrong, and reaches its tentacles because darkness just falls into the cracks wherever the sun can't shine. Sin goes further than we think. It goes a lot further and a lot deeper than we think. It's amazing. The deepest part of the ocean, seven or eight miles deep, is that what it is, Adam? Seven or eight miles? To almost unfathomable. It's dark. The animals don't even have pigment. The fish don't even have pigment down there. Sin goes further than you think. Um, if you watch somebody's marriage unroll, it may start with something small, but the ramifications go further and further and further. If you watch uh, dishonesty in business, it might start cutting corners in a certain place, and it shows up over here. And when you try to cover numbers in a book, numbers mess you up, man. That's why on this whole COVID thing, I said, well, don't go by your feelings. Go by the numbers. Because numbers don't lie. Unless you manipulate them, of course. But numbers don't lie. And so we want to remember that sin is so horrible. What we're seeing in the world today and the heartache that is caused in the world today is the ramifications of willfully disobeying the known laws of God. People intentionally disobeying the thing that God has set before us. And thank goodness God gave it to us in his book. And I want to repeat this later too, is we have to keep studying this book. I haven't preached this for seven years, but it's going to affect me the same way or even more powerful now after what life has shown me. Why? Why do God's people suffer? Why do God's people suffer? I'm serving you the best of my ability, Lord, and I still am hurt. Because the scripture tells us that the sun has to shine on the good and the ungood. The just and the unjust will have the sun shine on them. If Jesus and your Christianity was a lucky rabbit's foot in your pocket, then that's how we would treat it. You're lucky, John, because you got this talisman. You got this Jesus. You got this cross on you. You're a lucky man. You got, you got a mate. No, you're not. Because guess what? That rabbit, he only got three legs now. He wasn't so lucky, he wasn't. So the sun shines on you, and the rain falls on you, and it falls on me, and it fell on Christ on the cross, so that you wouldn't use that as your Savior. So you couldn't use your position as your Savior. Because remember, go back to the fact that he always wants a personal relationship with you. That's all of the deal. There, you don't add to it. You don't take away from it. He wants to be in that marriage relationship with you. He doesn't want you to have a talisman and say, well, I'm a Christian. I'm going to have a million dollars and a new car because I love Jesus more than you. Or I gave the money at the right time. And never intended, not in Scripture. And your relationship with Him is what it's all about. Wow, we'd like to Hollywood it up. We'd like to Las Vegas it up because... Someone's going to make money off that, right? It's never been like that. It's always been about a heart relationship with him. And through the death on his cross, he gave us his spirit to allow it to be possible for us to live that way. So the sun is going to shine. And you know what? Some bad things happen to good people. They do. And like I've been telling you since our superintendent told us, that's why you need Jesus. That's why you have Jesus. You have him because the sun's going to shine on you both. We always take count when a rotten person doesn't die and a good person, don't you? Come on. You know, I, I, I know you do because when you go to a, bat, a little league game and they go, well, no one's going to keep score. Everybody keeps score. It, it, no, we're not counting the points. Believe me, they're counting the points. Isn't that right, Randy? They all, they all know. But how come we get... We, you know, we're not keeping score, but we crossed the plate 27 times and y'all didn't cross it twice. We're not keeping score. 
But that's not how it is in life, you know, because a lot of bad people die horrendous ways. And I just want to throw this in after years of pastor, and I want you to know this. Your faithfulness to the Holy Spirit and to the leadership of God has kept you from so many horrible things. So many bad things that people are dying from today. God has protected you and formed a wall around you to keep you from that desire, that undesirable behavior that's going to lead to death. You know, the Ten Commandments are more things you can do instead of things you can't do if you're walking with Jesus. Anyway, I digress. How about this one, guys? Why does God come and get us now? There's so much heartache out there. I can't even have children because my kids are going to have to put up in a bad world. People are not having children because the world's going to be even worse tomorrow than it is today. My God is going to be greater tomorrow than he is today. My God is going to be more powerful, more insightful, more directive. And you know what? Yeah, the world's not going to get to be better. I, I think we're, we're over the curve, guys. I think we're looking forward to Jesus coming. But you know how much cheer, even if Jesus came when your kids were like those little boys right there, can you see the delight in their eyes of seeing Christ come over the hillside? It's going to be a party. Those little kids are going to go, I don't know all about all this, but I know that. So, if you thought that Jesus should come today, that means you don't have a plan for your life. Because God has a purpose for you. God has a plan for you. I weep for all, let me say it, the black babies that have been aborted in the inner city because that's where they put the abortion clinics. I weep for all of those young men who went to war when it wasn't necessary and died. What families could they have had? What homes could they have had? How much we all would be better if we loved the Lord and we let the kids grow and to become men of God. I know, that's me, because I used to believe that anybody could be saved. And then the realization that some people just won't be saved came to me. And I had to pray and ask God to show me the way. Some people won't be saved. Wide is the road that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. So we have to be diligent. We have to reach out to all of those who will be saved. Amen. Who will trust in the Lord with all their hearts. Never forget what it's like to be lost without Jesus. You know, I, I've said this at meetings before, but can you imagine? You, you want to go have a good time and you can't party without a can of beer, without an injection, without a something or other. You don't even know what real joy is all about. John, I much enjoyed sitting in the creek on my chair with my hat on, soaking the water up and putting it over my head when it was 103. I think that's real joy. I think you can be happy. I like going up on the beach and have my dog bring me a live crab. That's a kick, man. That's, I can giggle about that. God doesn't come to get us right now because he wants to give more people a chance. After you've thought about how many wicked people are out there, I want you to understand how much God loves you and loves the world. We think that God's biting his fingernails when good people get taken advantage of and die. But that is not God's love. God's love is bigger. God knows, bring the babies home. Bring, bring the loved ones home. Bring Josh home. Because there's someone out there that could find me. Someone in that telebond, someone in that other group, someone over here could come to know me and I treasure every soul. Why does abortion have to be abhorrent to the church of Jesus Christ? Because every one of you is worth this much to God. This much. If I'm telling you sin is this big, I'm telling you he thinks you are this much. People that take their own lives don't do it because he has a plan for you even if you don't think it's a noble plan because you're one dice you're one cog in a plan that God has worked out and sometime if you miss 
three steps on a ladder, you're not going to get to the top. You might be the step for another person to be all that God wants them to be. You might be the cookie lady in the church. You might be the Bible story person in the church. You might be the inviter in the church. I've seen some people, the only thing they do in the kingdom, they're not very good Christians, but they sure invite people to church so God's kingdom can advance in spite of. And one pastor one time, I said, man, I said, Brad, how come I can't get anybody to help me do this with all these kids? Look at it, i got 35 kids and I need something to do. <clears throat> how come those people aren't helping me more? He said, Don, he said, you're going to find that in the kingdom. That's where good mentoring comes in. I, I thank God for that. He said, some people will only allow God to use them to a certain level, and there's nothing you can do about that. Use that level to advance the kingdom the best that you can. Use that level to build it upon another level. So the kingdom can go on. So God doesn't come and get you now because this is all part of his plan. He believes that much in the individual, that much in the heart and life that's out there. Um, way more important than we to give. I, I, I think um, young people with low self-esteem is the tragedy of our day and age. Anymore, all of the rooster crow cockiness is always trumped up anyway. But I think that young girls with no self-esteem who sell themselves out, I think that young boys who do stupid things to get recognition to prove themselves, it, it is totally missed the mark. In each so precious to God, be careful how you plan your future, how you work your future, and stay close to God. And I said when that other boss asked me, about Josh, how do you get one like this? Our young people need to hear God's voice early and often, and they need to learn to be led by His voice, to be led by His direction, to use the scriptures, to use godly friends, and to walk in the way as He instructs them. And all of that is its inherent pitfalls. Boys and girls, you can't be like your moms and dads, period. You have to get your own identity in Christ. You can't be like your friends in Christ. You know, I, I lost a lot of good friends. I didn't really lose them. Because they still asked me to pray at the high school reunion. But I don't party with the guys that I party with in school once I found the Lord. And I don't got to hang around with them. And when I see them there at the class reunion with their second wives and third wives, and I see them there with broken wives, I know why God pulled me to the side and said, walk this way. And I, and I still love them. And uh, we don't party that way. We don't, we don't hang out that way. Well, that's really boring. But, uh, tell you what, you get a 30-year world and a wife and figure out how boring that is. <laughs> that's a joke, guys. I'm kidding with you, okay? <laughs> why do we have to face trials? You are facing trials so that you will figure out, and Peter says you will be refined like gold. In other words, the dross, the waste, is going to come off the top and be scooped away from you. And because you've endured to the end, not only do you get to hear him say, well done, my good and faithful servant, you've been faithful in what I've given you. Come and enjoy with me. It's going to be a moment that erases a lot of pain. And the whys are going to be gone. And that's true. But I stole the first part of my sermon because I really do think that that's why we don't have to be crushed to know him. But I think the trials of life for the Christian redefines Christ to us. We, the same voice, but now more clarity to hear what he wants of us to go where he wants us to go. Um, and here's, I threw this one in at the end because I want to tell you this. And, and I know it's something that I have to deal with someday and that you'll have to deal with someday. Unless I go first, I'll 
Kathy, you're on your own. Uh, <laughs> loneliness. How do we deal with loneliness as a Christian? Why are we alone even though we have Christ next to us? To overcome death, to overcome... You know what? And I don't think it's good for man to be alone. The Bible says it. It's not good for man to be alone. I pray for those who have lost their mates, who haven't found their mates, to pray and ask God. And I would say, oh, you all got to find somebody else really quick. No. I watched my Aunt Alcha. How many years did she live without her husband? 40 years after her husband passed. And I remember her at 84, we were going to come over because she made the best macaroni and cheese I ever ate in my life. And she made real, her last name was Swear when she was made, and her name was Bordeaux later, but she made deep Dutch apple pie from Holland. I mean, it was the real deal. And we were going to come over and see her one time, and she said, Well, I have to take the old people to the Bible study. And she was driving her car at 84. And she had to drive the old ladies of the church to Bible study. <laughs> she never married again. The most delightful. I would I would sit in her house, you know, before Kathy. Did you ever hear her play the piano, honey? Yeah, and she would sing way off key. I don't even know what key is, but that, that's what I ever heard of. And she would sing so loud on the old songs on her piano. And, and enjoy herself. She found ways to be fulfilled even without remarrying, is what I'm trying to say. What a long way to say that. I think God has so much a purpose, and it's going to change because you've lost half of you. And just let God lead you in that. Uh, gaze at Christ. And you know what? Glance at problems. Glance at problems, but gaze. Gaze upon Christ. If Christ overcome death, then we, we shall too. Um, Jesus was a real man, and he had real needs just like us. All the things that you felt and are feeling are things that he went through. We know that. Know that. But remember, he rose again so that you would have faith and believe. God will answer your questions like he answered Christ the same way. And we have a privilege because... We have seen him do it. We have. He is complete. And I, you know, I got some hand scratch notes here that I thought maybe you could just you want to write something down that might help. How can we enter heaven's gates and face and, and complete the task with all the questions that come our way? Number one, I put. You got to study your Bible. You got to study your Bible. Don't study your Bible like this because that really hurts my eyes. And don't study it like this. Get the proper perspective on the scriptures and read those stories. Read them because they need to play like that video in your mind. Read them. And then I said, the next thing you're going to have to do to, to make why abolish in your life is you're going to have to pray. You have to pray to discern the will of God. And remember, he still speaks in what? Still small voice. He still speaks in a still small voice. Number three, I put don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't get tired. tired. Don't neglect to meet together as a habit of some. Don't forget to go to church. Don't forget that your faith is important to God, that you're important to God, and only through your faith can you connect with Him. So don't quit. Don't quit. I've seen a lot of churches during this pandemic just quit. That's why I love this church, because we ain't going to quit. We may get our nose bloody now and then, but we ain't going to quit. I'm not gonna, that's what you did. You got good cop, bad cop. I'm letting Angus be the good cop on this one. You get it? You get it, Steve? <laughs> How about this? Turn off the headphones. I give this to my wrestlers. Turn off the head, turn off the outer media in our world today because they're making it nuts. They're making it nuts, guys. Turn off the TV. Turn off the radio. 
go down the road with nothing going on. My wife hates that because then I start to sing off key. But like some, it's, a, it's your burden, honey. You've got to handle it. It's, it's the way it is. Because there's an opportunity for God to direct your mind when you're not so preoccupied with what the world wants you to think about. Um, how about this one? Your reputation in the community is important. You are ambassadors of Jesus Christ. You've been given that title. You are one of the chosen few. Why would they want to be like you? Give them a reason. Give them a reason. Be found in Christ. Be found in Him. It's not a bad question to say, would Jesus be doing this if He returned right now? Would I want to be doing this? And if it's no, then don't do this. Because who knows the day or the hour He'll return. I remember that one sermon I had here. And I kept running over the door to see if Jesus was going to drive up later on late. He goes, but you may have seen like He was coming any minute now. Yeah. How about that? He could come before you get to the car, folks. Do you think any of the prophets that have been fulfilled are enough? Do you think any more need to be fulfilled? Well, you could dig them up and find them, but I think nobody knows the day or the hour. And he said that for a reason. It wasn't an accident. Only the Father knows. Well, but that's cheating. Yeah, can you imagine somebody arguing with God if he comes back before point so-and-so or scroll such-and-such such wasn't broken, Steve. Imagine that. Well, God, it's like us taking Josh to Disneyland, huh? I'm calling Carl. You didn't, you didn't tell me. <laughs> you say, God, you didn't break that seal. I didn't see all those people die of it. Can you imagine? Not a third of the population died from a disease. Oh, that could happen in a couple days, in a couple weeks in a couple minutes. Oh, well, they didn't rise up against, oh, they've been rising up against everybody for so long. You know, it's very possible that all the Bible prophecies in the world that we understand could be done, might be done. My Bible just tells me you need to be on lookout for the Jesus coming any minute. You need to be in constant, you don't have to understand all the scripture to get to heaven. You don't have to understand all the Bible prophecy. Oh, don't get me going here. I like to study it because I think it's crazy, man. It's it's layer upon layer of prophecy that's been fulfilled. Yet, Christ can come in any minute. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for allowing us to look at this tender part of our hearts and lives that Lord, we don't understand. We, we, we don't know why. Why is, is a hard question on this side of heaven. And, and to realize that you were over here with us and you looked at the Father and said, where'd you go? What, what, why is it like this? And yet, you rose again. And we will too, Father. We thank you. We're going to trust that your path is our path. And that we'll follow you until the day you return. Lord, if we, if we pass away before then, make our lives count, Father. Help us to be a step in somebody else's ladder. Help us to be a helper. Help us to be the leader. Help us to be the ladder. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. We just pray that you continue to bless our children, bless our nation, bless God's people as they, as they all worship today. May you speak to our hearts. We praise you. And we have a couple prayer requests. Andrea is going into the hospital Tuesday for pre-op, for a Wednesday surgery for lung cancer. Dave and Andrew, remember that. And Stan and Barb are not here today. So let's remember to pray for Andrea. Father, we just now, as your church, reach out to Andrea and play. We know that you can even uh, take care of the cancer before she gets to the pre-op. Father, when they go on the pre-op and find nothing there, I believe you can do that. But if not, Father, we pray that the physicians would have the wisdom to go about the process the right way, that you would allow her to sense your presence in an oh so special way, that Dave would be encouraged by your great love, and that we would all together pray for them and lift them up, and we'll glorify you for the outcome. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.